I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week you're stuck with me on my own, I'm afraid, but it is mercifully a relatively short one as I'm going a bit off piece and I'm trying out some of this newfangled technology the kids are all talking about. Um, and I'm also recording outdoors thanks to um, Richard from the Veg Grower Pod who came and interviewed me the other week and encouraged me to try and, and record outdoors. So you will hear probably bees and some flies, crickets, possibly some cats, um, possibly a neighbour starting up a tractor because although I live in the countryside and you think it's nice and peaceful, there's always someone trying to disrupt my peace. So hopefully we won't get too distracted. Um, So I thought this week we'd have a quick chat about what's going on in my garden and what's going on is that the plants are all flowering their socks off. The insects are going crazy, as you may hear, and I'm doing hardly anything because it's either been ridiculously hot or chucking down with rain here. Um, and this is generally the time of year that if you've done your prep earlier in the year, then really the only thing you need to be worrying about is watering and a bit of deadheading. Um, and what I mean by prep really comes down to two things, which are mulching and planting. And I know I'm always going on about it, but mulching is one of the most important things you can do in the garden because at this time of the year, the mulch is keeping the weeds down. It's feeding your plants. It's keeping the moisture locked in the soil below. And if any weeds do come up, um, it's much easier to pull them out of loose mulch because they haven't been able to get their roots down tightly into compacted soil. And when it comes to planting, I can't recommend packing in your plants cheek by jowl highly enough And if you fill your bed with plants, there's really no space for other things to take a hold. So this is the time in my garden um, that everything's crammed in. And um, also my dahlias are just starting to take off too. So um, a little reminder that if you haven't already, uh, my first ever episode was about dahlias. And there's loads of good info in that episode if you're growing dahlias as well this year. So do go back and have a listen to that. So what I'm going to do for this episode is a little bit different because I'm going to invite you on a walk around of my garden. But to join me to find out what's going on, you will have to head over to my YouTube channel, which is Roots and All. And I'm doing this because as you probably don't want to be stuck indoors at this time of the year, neither do I. So I'm taking to the outdoors and I hope you'll come with me. And if you do join me over on YouTube, you'll be able to see my garden, warts and all, and I don't know about roots and all, and it will be there in all its messy glory for you to judge, and hopefully you'll see that your garden isn't so bad after all. Um, And the other thing I wanted to talk about is what I'm collectively calling the gardening media. And this episode was provoked by a few interesting conversations I've had about who qualifies as being part of the gardening media and what their various roles are. So I'm speaking specifically from a UK perspective, although I suspect the global picture with regards to the media is pretty much the same, uh, where we're living in a digital post-print world to a lesser or greater extent. And the channels of communication have become cheaper and more available, which allows independent journalists a platform. So I think there are probably two warring factions, really. Uh, Then there's everybody else who falls somewhere on the scale between these two. So at the one end, you have those who consider writing or broadcasting to be their profession. So what they write about to a greater or lesser degree isn't important. Their skill is in producing a slick professional product. For example, when I worked in the magazine industry, it wasn't uncommon for writers or editors to work across a range of titles or to switch from one title to another. So, of course, they learned about the industries they were writing about as they went along, or they may have had some idea about them before moving into the role, but they generally weren't actively working in the field they were writing about, um, nor indeed had they ever. And there were some who had a career in a specific industry and then moved into commentating on that industry. And there were also some who wrote guest pieces or a weekly column for a magazine. But I'm just making the point that to work in the gardening media, you may not necessarily have a huge knowledge of what you're writing about or what you're commissioning pieces about. So, of course, gardening journalists generally have to write about a range of topics. Therefore, they're expected to be experts on a vast range of topics, which is is really difficult, if not impossible. So there will be instances where instead of basing their writings upon first-hand experience, they'll repeat something they've heard or read in a book. So 
as you go higher up the structure of the organisation, you also have editors and publishers, and they are even less likely to have worked directly in horticulture or to have first-hand experience of plants. Their role is to make a publication or a TV programme work on all levels. It has to look visually appealing. It has to fulfil the briefs set out by the parent company. It needs to generate revenue, achieve target viewing stroke sales figures and so on. And they are bringing pressures to bear on content that go well beyond just making sure the best content reaches the audience. So I'm sorry if I'm stating the obvious here, but I just want to make sure that you know, you're kind of getting what I'm saying with this. Um, So the professional journalists who generally get paid for their work rightly consider what they do a profession with high standards and within which they're required to know a lot more than when just to plant your tulips. So when the garden bloggers rock up with their WordPress site or the podcasters broadcast their ramblings on iTunes, for example, for as little as a tenner or so that it costs for hosting fees, you can see why professional journalists might get a little bit... Uh, ticked off and my podcast is edited and that costs me money and I pay for website management and I take a lot of time away from paid work to research and produce content and I'm really lucky because I can do that and although I do suffer financially and I'm really grateful for those people that have donated money and become Patreons um, I've taken a decision to fund the podcast myself because I believe what I'm doing is important Um, but I'm ultimately competing with journalists and They may say I'm not because they may not rate my work, which is fine. Um, But I am doing essentially for free what they expect to be paid for. Um, And it's like my garden design career. So I can train and be educated and informed. And someone can come along and decide they want to be a garden designer with no training or qualifications. And they don't really need to make much money off it. So they can afford to produce a design for next to nothing. And I might miss out on a job because of that person, because prices always an important driving factor for customers however much people want to pretend that it's not and similarly a landscape architect might look upon my training as not as good as theirs and feel I'm taking work from them and ultimately that's how things work in an open market and a consumer needs choices and they need to accept the consequences of these decisions that they make be they good or bad Um, but however when I design a garden I'm not providing information to the masses I'm usually just assisting one family or one group of people and I can make a mistake maybe that will affect their home and their garden I could make a mistake that might affect their surrounding ecosystem and I can repeat this mistake in many gardens but there will always be a limit to the problems I could potentially cause and for me that's the difference and why gardening media is so powerful and ultimately so capable of doing good or bad It only takes one journalist writing for a national magazine or one press release from a respected institution or one product endorsement and thousands upon thousands of people can be influenced to buy that product or to try that method of gardening. And when you realise bigger media organisations and horticultural institutions are not always guided by first-hand knowledge and that they are guided by commercial interests, you can see the potentially huge problems. And that's why I think it's important for us to have independent journalists, bloggers, YouTubers and podcasters in the gardening world. Um, There's only one kind of drawback. You see some of them reach a certain audience size and you can see maybe sponsorship deals, advertising deals, product endorsements creeping in. And as soon as that happens... With the best will in the world, and no matter how much integrity that person has, they might feel obliged to a greater or lesser degree to appease the company that's invested in them. So whether that means that company has some control over or suggests content, or it means the person no longer feels able to criticise that product or anything like it, you can see how this becomes a problem. And it only becomes more so the more companies they have yanking their chain. So what I've taken a really long time saying is that In this day and age, you have a wonderful choice as a media consumer. You can get your information from a huge variety of sources and you can decide which you trust and which you treat with scepticism. And you can do this because there's a lot of information out there. However, the free model of content is not sustainable for most people. And the only way you can get access to content that is truly independent of everything except the creator's own biases, and and there is that to consider 
is to pay for it like you would pay for a newspaper or a subscription to a TV service because there's never free content. You either have to fund it directly or you pay the price by receiving information that's compromised by revenue generating interests. And I'm not saying this because I'd like you to all become Patreon subscribers, although of course I would, but to spell out the current situation that we're in and the way things will have to be if we want to receive good information about gardening in the future. And actually, it's not just about gardening. This kind of goes beyond the gardening world. It goes, it's, 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 I'm speaking about all the media here and I don't think I'm telling you anything that you've not come to realise for it, especially recently with the things that have been going on in politics and, you know, that there's documentaries now about how much we've been influenced to vote certain ways or to, to support certain things. Um, so, as I say, this is, I'm just kind of spelling out the reality behind how people get paid and how this system works. Um, so... I can't see a better model, to be honest, than voluntarily paying a contribution based on the information you feel you've received. And I do think it's the way forward. And I think it's the way people will be held accountable and no longer able to churn out crap and expect to get paid for it. I think that we are moving towards a merit-based reward system. Um, I myself am a patron subscriber to a couple of podcasts and I've made donations in the past to independent content creators, I think, who are doing good work. And when my favourite podcast hosts release a book or pay content or other products, I will try and buy them when, when I can because I realise it's a good way to show support and it's a way to secure the future of information that I find valuable. So to reiterate, this isn't me with my begging bowl. Um, it's just a gentle reminder that you pays your money and you takes your choice with the media in this day and age. So thanks for listening and I will be back next Tuesday with another podcast episode. Have a great week. 